Hello and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, 37th Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different, different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Topia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. I'm your host, Adam Getacho. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Blue Health Ethiopia. And it's a pleasure to have Dr. Alpha Saifui back, back again here with us. And she's going to give us a presentation on the basic principles of fracture management. For those of you who don't know Dr. Alpha, uh, Dr. Alpha is an assistant professor of orthopedic and trauma surgery. Uh, she is also a surgical care equity advocate and a, a researcher. All right, thank you, Adam, for that uh, generous introduction. It's good to be back with you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you had a really good day. So today's uh, topic of interest is going to be uh, discussing basic principles of uh, fracture management. Before I uh, go on, I'd like to disclose that this is not by any means a comprehensive lecture. It is more or less an introduction. And in addition to that, I'd like to disclose that I'm recovering from COVID. So I, my voice might break from time to time. So if you have any serious audibility issues, if I have any serious audibility issues, please feel free to interrupt me at them and tell me to be more audible. So I'm going to uh, uh, dive right into it. So our learning objectives is going to be to define and classify fractures, understand how bone heals, to comprehend the epidemiology of fracture and their causes, and also to diagnose and manage patients with the fracture and to understand and prevent complications following the fracture. So this is going to be uh, the flow of the presentation. This is going to be the outline. So before we dive uh, right into uh, our topic of interest, I'd like to bring your attention to some stats that I believe are very important because I believe that this is going to be a public health issue uh, for us in, in Ethiopia and also in a, for a lot of uh, low and middle income countries, especially low income countries. So these are the facts about road traffic injuries. There are 1.25 uh, million road traffic injuries occurring every year, according to the WHO. And three out of four deaths following road traffic injury are among men. So the productive uh, working uh, portion of the population. And it's because it's actually number one cause of death among those aged between 15 and 29 uh, years of age. And there are uh, about 50 million people injured every year because of road traffic accidents. So here you can see that low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected uh, by road traffic injury. Here you can see that um, road, traffic, road traffic fatalities per 100,000 people for low, middle, uh, for low income countries is actually the highest. It's 24.1. It's, our countries is actually higher than that, higher than uh, the, the low, low income countries average. So your chances of dying from road traffic injuries uh, depends on where you live. And if you live in Africa, the chances are of fatality is uh, quite high compared to the rest of uh, the world. So when we come to uh, our country, we're seeing uh, an unprecedented spike in uh, road traffic injury mortality rates year by year, and it's, it doesn't seem to be slowing down, and we expect it to be on the rise for the coming uh, few years. Ethiopia actually has one of the lowest numbers of countries, the uh, number of cars in the world. It's actually close to just 1 million for 100 more than 100 million people. But we have the fatality rate of 28 per 100,000 people, which is one of the highest. It's actually double the international uh, stat. So uh, this is going to be a, a disaster. It's going to be a number one. It, it is actually already a number one killer for the youth. And it's, it's, it's on the rise until we do something about it. So these are stats from uh, our department. It shows the distribution of uh, proportion of uh, permanent musculoskeletal disability 
following injury. And you can see that the, the number one cause is road traffic injury followed by machine and fall. And uh, actually very recent stats uh, published uh, recently, I couldn't get uh, access to that paper, but there's a new paper published showing that actually person to person uh, inflicted injury is second to road traffic injury followed by uh, occupational uh, injuries. So this shows the distribution of site of injury and of, of a permanent musculoskeletal uh, disability. Here you can see that uh, lower extremity uh, is only second to hand injuries. So you can imagine what this means for, the, for that person's livelihood and also for the general e economy of the country where we're having unprecedented levels of uh, road traffic injuries and occupational injuries, and they're affecting the working population. Not only is it affecting the working population, it is affecting the hands of the working population. So it's essentially uh, debilitating them and putting them out of the, uh, the workforce. So I believe it requires all due attention and anyone in attendance today uh, in, uh, uh, should pay attention to that. It is actually a public health problem. It is going to be a public health issue and uh, no less than TB or HIV was. So I'd like to bring that to uh, your attention. So this is a bit of advocacy work, I guess. So here it shows that it's actually the working age group, 20 to, to, to 60, that's suffering a permanent musculoskeletal disability. And this is a case distribution for specifically our department. It's a study done uh, for over 30 years. And uh, it shows that uh, most of our, our cases are trauma. So 70% of our both inpatient, outpatient emergency cases are actually uh, trauma cases. And there is an act, another breakdown showing uh, the last 10 years. So this is for the 30 years with, uh, the, the, from, the, from the 30 years stat. But with, within the last 10 years, it's actually uh, rise, risen up to 90%. So 90% of what we do in the biggest hospital in the country, in the orthopedics department, is involves trauma. It's, uh, it's because of cases uh, resulting from trauma, and most of them are uh, preventable uh, cases. So, uh, having uh, this is another stat showing which which sites are more affected, and we see a lot of femur. So we're saying we're seeing much more higher high uh, high energy injuries than we used to see ten years or twenty years ago. So femur shaft fractures are on, on the rise. And now we're seeing a lot of pelvic pelvises and acetabulum. So the last 10 years, we're seeing a lot of high energy injuries, like life-threatening injuries. Pelvic and acetabular fractures are not just limb-threatening, they are life-threatening injuries. So we're seeing musculoskeletal injury that, co that costs people's uh, lives. So uh, that's all for the advocacy. So I'm going to go uh, right into today's topic of interest. So what is fracture? Fracture is a break in the continuity of a cortex of the bone. So it results from failure of the bone to either respond to the high impact, which can be direct uh, or indirect. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a failure to, uh, res uh, to uh, respond to the, the impact. So uh, there's a saying that uh, fracture is actually soft tissue injury with a broken bone. Uh, that saying came about to emphasize that if the bone is fractured, that means it's definitely high energy. And there is, without question, extensive soft tissue injury. So it is important to pay attention to that. We tend to put our eyes right on the, uh, on the fracture and also think about how to stabilize it, how to fix it, how to attend to it. But fracture is actually a major, major, major soft tissue injury involved. And the fact that the bone has now broken is, a, is an indication that the soft injury is quite extensive. So I would like you to keep that in mind. So we tend to want to classify our fractures. So why is that important? Why do we classify our fractures? Uh, for multiple reasons. One is to guide our treatment to assess prognosis and to most importantly, to speak a common language. So where, when a person describes a fracture, to me over the phone, I should be able to thoroughly understand without having to see the x-ray, 
where the fracture is, what type it is, and then have some kind of understanding of the severity of it. So that's why it's important that we're all well averse in uh, identify uh, uh, in classifying our fractures because most people are good at uh, diagnosing it, knowing whether or not there, there's a fracture, but it's also important to thoroughly uh, uh, describe it and classify it. So we use multiple ways of uh, classifying fractures, either based on etiology, based on cl clinical classification, and also radiological classification, and we'll see that uh, one by one. So based on etiology, we have uh, three classifications, traumatic fractures, pathologic fractures, and stress fractures. So traumatic fractures are a result of sudden excessive force, which can be direct force or indirect force. So in this case, the, it's the excessiveness of the force that has caused the fracture. Otherwise, the bone is healthy. But when we come to pathological fractures, these are a result of an, abnormal, an abnormally weak bone and the, the force is actually uh, is not excessive severe force, but uh, it results in a fracture only because the bone is already weak. And stress fractures are uh, a, res a result from repetitive minimal trauma to the same site. So it's the repetition, the repetition that causes the fracture. So it's uh, it's like a dripping force that's uh, incessant and it's that persistence of the force that causes uh, the, the fracture. It's, in, in, it's important to know whether the force is a direct, uh, a direct blow or an indirect uh, mechanism because that tells us a lot about how extensive uh, the soft tissue injury is. So in an, an, in an indirect mechanism, the, the, the force is uh, the force does not result in extensive soft tissue injury, whereas in a direct injury where it's a direct hit, the, we can expect extensive soft tissue injury. And that's important for both our management and uh, for both the management of the soft tissue and also the management of uh, our fracture. So pathologic fractures are a result of multiple things that, uh, uh, that weaken the bone, which, are, which can be generalized bone diseases, can be malignancy, benign, benign conditions, um, metastasis of different kinds of tumors to the bone, anything, whether metabolic or local, that weakens uh, the bone at that particular site and makes it susceptible to fracture is what we consider a pathology. And in these bones, uh, we have to, this is why we need to take good history. So we need to ask our patients to describe the kind of force that was inflicted upon them because a trivial trauma causing a femur fracture is not possible unless the bone is already weakened. So we need to further uh, examine these patients. So these are some examples of pathologic fracture. Here you can see that there's clearly, in addition to the fracture line, you can see that the bone is ill. There are uh, multiple lesions. So on the first image, you can see that there is a uh, lucency there, right, right around the, uh, the fracture, which implies uh, 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 an, a, a, a pathologic fracture. So the, the first image is uh, actually chondrosarcoma, although it's not a very, it's not a really common site for chondrosarcoma, but there's chondrosarc that's uh, chondrosarcoma. And uh, the second image is actually due to uh, an infection. So that's another, uh, uh, cause for a pathologic fracture. The third shows a diffuse uh, kind of moth-eaten kind of pattern of bone lesion, which is which is something we see in, a, in, in different uh, disease uh, pathologies, the, the disease conditions. But in this case, it's uh, Paget's disease, and uh, the fourth is um, a vertebral fracture secondary to metastasis to that site, and the like. So you get the idea. So stress fractures, like I've said before, it's because of the abnormal repetitive force in a normal bone. So there are specific sites where we tend to see stress fractures, usually it's in the lower extremity. And out of the lower extremity, uh, it's common in certain kinds of patients to begin with, and then also at, common, at certain sites. So it's common in like 
uh, what we call the weekend warriors, uh, athletes, um, and uh, new military recruits that, ha that are subjected to extensive uh, training, kind of training that, are, that, that their bodies are not used to. So it's an abnormally repetitive force that the bone is, has not gotten accustomed to. So the most common sites are the tibia, the second metatarsal, and then you move up the femur neck is another common site. So yeah, like I've said, it's common in athletes, dancers, military recruits. So another way of classifying fractures is based on their clinical presentation. So can be classified, we can, we can broadly classify them as uh, closed and open fracture. Uh, we're, we're kind of moving away from the terminologies of simple and compound fracture because uh, simple implies that the soft tissue injury is, is not there, but it is it just, it just so happens that it's not communicating with the external environment. So to properly define uh, open fractures, the, these are fractures that have a direct or indirect communication with the external environment. So let's say uh, you have a pelvic fracture with a vag associated with a vaginal injury. We consider that an open fracture. So uh, even communication with the, with the bowel, with the body cavity, is also counts as an open fracture because we expect uh, extensive contamination in those circumstances. So an open fracture is uh, infected by definition. So we treat open fractures as an infected, uh, as an infection site by definition. So a fracture that has opened up into the an, into a body cavity, whether the bladder, the the, the uterus, the vagina, the the bowels, all of them count as open fracture. So I'd like you to remember this definition. So open fracture are of serious concern to us. Uh, and the, the open fractures are one of the emergencies uh, in, in orthopedics. So we tend to uh, attend to them as early as possible. They are, they, they, they are limp and life-threatening conditions as far as we're concerned. And we, we make sure that we thoroughly uh, identify them. We, you should never miss an open fracture and also classify it well. And we use mis multiple classification systems, but the most popular is Rossello Anderson classification uh, system. This was initially des designed for the tibia, but we do uh, use this classification system for uh, most uh, open fractures. It's easy for communication and it's, it's used to, um, it, it has a prognostic value and also management implications. So even though the inter-observer agreement is very poor, like two people are uh, may, may classify the same fracture as uh, different uh, Gustav Anderson classifications, but still Gustav Anderson classification is very popular Everyone should be well, well versed in it. And if you tell me uh, it's a Gustavo Anderson one, I'll have a very different impression uh, than Gustavo Anderson if you tell me it's a, a, a 3B uh, or a 3A, because the, the prognosis is very different and also, so is the management. And also the urgency with which we attend to it is also very different. So uh, like I've said, uh, fracture healing, infection, and amputation relate, uh, rate correlates to the degree of soft tissue injury by, by Gustavo Anderson. So it has uh, prognostic Im implications. Uh, I would like you to note that we don't, uh, we don't definitively classify a fracture using the Gustavo Anderson classification until we have the patient in the OR and we have done our first debridement. So I'm not going to uh, go into every one of them, but there are broadly three, and uh, Gustavo Anderson three is classified into further classified into A, B, and C. And this classification is based on the uh, size of the wound, the level of contamination 
the extent of soft tissue injury and the extent of a bone injury. So these four parameters are taken into account to classify uh, a fracture. So why is this important? So like I've said, the infection rates widely range between grade one and grade like three, uh, 3C or even just 3A. So here you can see it, it varies from 2% infection rates in, in Gustav Anderson 1 to 5 to 10 to even 50% infection rates when we have a vascular injury in 3C. So this is why we, we have to uh, adequately classify it and address it uh, accordingly. So these are some examples to each one of them. If it was uh, if, if it was an interactive session, I would have had you somebody guess which one is uh, what, but you can look at them uh, later on. Another classification system is the Shireen classification for open fractures. It's not as popular as uh, Gustavo Anderson, but we, we do use it in, in, especially in uh, research work and also when we want to be very specific about the extent of soft tissue injury, sometimes we use it, but it's not as popular. Another way of classifying factors is the radiological classification system. So this is based on the configuration or the pattern of injury on the fracture that we see on the X-ray. So this is important because it tells us something about the mechanism of injury. So when you see a spiral fracture, for example, you know that it was a twisting kind of injury. When it's a transverse fracture, you assume it's a bending kind of force that has been applied to that uh, to that bone. Of course, usually in real life, we don't we don't find a pure for, for a pure direction for our forces, right? They come in combination, but this kind of tells us which is the uh, the predominant kind of uh, force of direction that has uh, been inflicted to that specific bone. So that's the importance of knowing uh, the configuration and the pattern. Not only that, it also has management implications. We manage these fractures, uh, these fracture patterns differently. So that's why we need to thoroughly identify them. So yeah, like uh, I've said, the, it's important to identify the pattern because it tells us about the fracture scores, predicts the risk of redisplacement of the reduction, and it predicts the time of healing. For, for, uh, for example, spiral fractures heal much faster than transverse ones do. And comminuted fractures uh, have uh, a more uh, protracted pace of healing. Yeah, like the, these are things I've already mentioned. It tells us the dominant uh, mechanism. So when you uh, come across a fracture, you identify that there is a fracture, you classify it as open or closed, and then you specify the location, is it proximal, is it distance, distal? You name the bone that's involved and you try to mention the mechanism of injury based on the pattern and you identify the pattern. And also you see the uh, displacement, the degrees of angulation. And you, you name if there's any associated neurovascular injury. So like I've said, please remember, fractures are extensive soft tissue injuries with a broken bone and not the other way around. So having said that, we need to understand how bone uh, heals. So uh, broadly, we can, we can classify uh, the healing process or the types of healing as primary fracture healing, which is what we call a direct union, or secondary fracture healing, which is healing by callus. So uh, we'll see the, uh, dif uh, the differences of these two. So the most common one we encounter is healing by callus. In, in, in healing by callus or secondary fracture healing, there are uh, certain steps that we expect, although they overlap, but we initially expect hematomoformation followed by inflammation and cellular proliferation, which is the migration of inflammatory cells and cytokines to the site and neovascularization, followed by callus formation where, uh, where uh, where uh, uh, a callus breach is uh, laid out by chondroblasts. And then that is going to be uh, uh, taken over by osteoblasts and new bone is formed. And that's uh, the consolidation stage. 
remodeling takes might take years. So here are some images to uh, reiterate what I've already said. So initially, we we immediately get a hematoma formation, which is within within like tw uh, twenty four to uh, forty eight hours, and then the clot is uh, broken down and uh, it's going it's going to be invaded by inflammatory cells and cytokines, and there's going to be neovascularization and chondroblasts are introduced to the site, and those chondroblasts uh, lay out the callus and uh, that callus is going to serve as a breach and uh, it's going to uh, decrease the strain at that fracture site, which is going to ultimately allow for osteoblasts to lay out, to lay down new bone and remodeling take years. So what affects bone healing? There are multiple local and systemic factors that affect uh, bone healing. One is age, the type and site of bone, like I've said, the pattern of fracture and distribution of uh, uh, any kind of local disturbance like compromised blood supply, extensive soft tissue damage to the site, and also our type of uh, reduction. So our type of reduction also determines what kind of bone healing process that fracture site is going to go. So if we are able to achieve anatomic reduction and decrease the strain at that fracture site, uh, the less than like, to like less than two percent, then the chances are it's going to have a direct uh, bone healing. It's not very uh, uh, common. It's not necessary for for you to be uh, aware of how that works unless you are uh, an orthopedic uh, surgeon or a, a, a resident. But essentially, there'll be like cutting uh, cones. There's not going to be any callus. There's no chondroblasts involved. The, because the strain is so low that osteoblasts are able to build new bone between those two fractured sites without requiring the bridging of a, a, a callus. And open fractures universally heal much, much slower than uh, uh, closed uh, fractures. Uh, please uh, remember that. And non-unions are common for open fractures. So open fractures are... Uh, are a risk for multiple complications. So how do we approach a patient with a fracture? So like we always say, you don't treat the fracture, you treat the patient. So that patient should be approached like any other trauma patient through the ATLS protocol strictly. No matter where the fracture is and no matter how well yeah, your patient looks, if he has gone through a trauma that's uh, severe enough to break a bone, it's it's worthy it's worth going through the ATLS protocol and making sure that he has no hemodynamic instability and no other associated injuries. So there is no easy local fracture unless proven otherwise. So from the history, we want to know about the injury. We want to we want to know uh, everything we can. We want to ask what the trauma was. Uh, the circumstances of it. We want to ask if there was any any other person injured. We want to ask if there was any death on the site because it tells us how severe the injury was. And we want to ask them any other history, like if they've had any pain at the site beforehand, if there is any uh, known uh, medical illness they have, any malignancy they've been uh, diagnosed, diagnosed with, everything we think uh, could cause, um, could be associated with that, with that fracture uh, should be uh, thoroughly uh, investigated for. So uh, when we jump into our physical examination in orthopedics, we follow the look, feel and move uh, pattern of uh, examining the musculoskeletal system. So we look at the sites for any swelling, bruising, any deformity, and deformity is usually a, sh a sure sign of either a fracture or a dislocation, usually a fracture. So we, we want to examine where the, whether the skin is intact or not, because we don't want to miss an open fracture. And we want to see if there is any posturing, any uh, color changes to the skin, and any associated injuries to the region or to any distant site. So for feel, 
We want to see if there is any tenderness. We want to examine the distal neurovascular structures. And please note to examine the neurovascular structures before and after any intervention, because your intervention can cause neurovascular injuries, especially attempts at reduction or immobilization could cause neurovascular, new neurovascular injuries. So please note that. So uh, when it, uh, I'm not an advocate for MOVE, uh, trying to elicit carpetus is incredibly, incredibly painful and it's no longer recommended, especially with the imaging modalities that we have now. There's no reason to subject your patients uh, to that kind of excruciating, uh, excruciating pain. But if there's already an abnormal movement, please note that. So uh, once we've uh, done our physical examination, we want to jump into investigation. And the most popular, and the most commonly used, and also the most efficient, uh, and uh, the one we use the most is uh, X-ray. We, we rarely require uh, uh, more further imaging than, uh, than an X-ray. An X-ray is a, a very good tool, especially if it's adequately taken. So you have to make sure that uh, a good X-ray is taken, otherwise it's a, a good tool for uh, investigating the bull. So we wanna get two views, two adequate views. We wanna, in children, if, if we're not sure and we wanna compare, we can get two limbs. Two joints should be included if we're, uh, if we're trying to look at the long bone. And if we're looking at a joint, at least one third of the, up, the proximal long bone and one third of the distal long bone should be included in that view. And in, patient, in certain kinds of fractures, uh, they, they tend to clump up together. They tend to come together. Like if you have a calcaneal uh, fracture from a person who fell from a height, you, you want to get a spine and pelvis x-ray because those two kinds of fractures tend to come together because that mechanism inflicts uh, those two kinds of injuries. So that's why we say two injuries. And two occasions for certain sites. For instance, scaphoid uh, fractures are hard to identify. The patient might have had a fall on an outstretch stand. They come with uh, complaining of pain. And you look at the x-ray, you even get your scaphoid view but you see nothing, there is no fracture line, but the patient still complains of pain. So in these circumstances, you wanna immobilize the patient, send them home, take another X-ray after 10 days. And then if there is a fracture line, it will be evident by then. Same thing applies for stress fractures and physial, <coughs> physial injuries. <clears throat> so on our X-ray, we wanna see if there is any the, we want to see for the personality of the fracture. We want to see if there is any uh, displacement. So displacement is a result of multiple things. It can be from the direct injury, it can be the pull of gravity, and also the way uh, muscles are positioned in that bone and the pull of the muscles can cause displacement. We further classify displacement as translation, angulation, and rotation. So I'll show you some images of uh, what that will look like. So the first one is an Im image of uh, angulation. So it can be uh, tuberous or, or valgus or procurvatum or recurvatum <clears throat> based on where uh, the location is. So we, we use that to describe and to, to know what's acceptable, what's not. So I'm not, going, I'm not going to go into detail on that. The second one, the second image shows uh, a translation kind of displacement. So we wanna be able to thoroughly describe these. So uh, in, this, uh, in this part, I want you to note that uh, out of all the displacements, the one that causes the most dysfunction and the one that we cannot accept by any means is rotation. If there is a rotational displacement, it's going to essentially uh, put that, if it heals in that position, in a rotated position, it's going to render that limb useless. So we don't accept any degree of rotation. If there is a, a rotation, there is no room for non-operative management. Operation is, uh, is, is, not, is not going to be uh, negotiable. So there are uh, further imagings we can do like CT scans and MRIs in, in certain sites that are just very complex. We can't uh, we can't do with an x-ray. For instance, the pelvis, the spine, uh, 
the calcaneum, uh, we're going to need a CT imaging to to describe the fracture well and visualize it and also make management decisions uh, and the like. And then MRI is a good tool for uh, soft tissues and also for uh, spine injuries, but it's not uh, an imaging uh, modality we order uh, left and right. <clears throat> so now we moved on to uh, uh, briefly and com uh, non-comprehensively describe uh, the principles of uh, fracture management. So in general, we, we, we want to stabilize the patient, treat the patient and uh, not the fracture. So stabilize your patient hemodynamically, provide analgesics, provide uh, other supportive uh, treatment modalities <coughs> as needed. And then for our definitive treatment, we wanna follow the cardinal rules of management of a fracture in orthopedics, which is reduction, maintain the reduction and rehabilitation. We say maintain the reduction uh, and not immobilization because we used to say immobilization. We used to say reduction, immobilization, and then rehabilitation. Those used to be the, the principles, but now we say reduction, maintain reduction and rehabilitation because not every fracture requires immobilization as I'll show you later on. Some, uh, we, need, we need to maintain the reduction, obviously, if it's an undisplaced and a fracture that is not going to displace, we want to see serial x-rays and make sure it's not, uh, it's, the reduction is maintained, but we may not need to put that patient on a splint, on a cast, or any other immobilization uh, modality. That's why uh, I'm not saying immobilize, I'm not saying immobilize, I'm saying maintain reduction. So uh, when we look at this uh, further, for reduction, we want to so we want to restore uh, the fracture uh, fragments to an acceptable position. It doesn't necessarily have to be anatomic position. We may not always need to put it exactly where it used to be. We may just put it where it is acceptable. So if it heals in that position, the patient is going to be functional. And we, we know that. So in those cases, we don't do anatomic reduction. So when we're doing non-operative management, we're not uh, trying to achieve anatomic reduction. We're trying to achieve functional reduction. So in that regard, we may employ either conservative op or open reduction or operative reduction uh, methods. So we, we could do closed reduction by manipulation, or we can try to do a closed reduction or conservative management by continuous traction like skin and skeletal traction. And for, for open reduction, we wanna, we wanna do basically that's a surgical reduction method. So we we're gonna go into surgery for that. So the second, one, the second step is to maintain that reduction that now we, we have now achieved. So we may or may not need to immobilize. So, but we still wanna keep the fracture fragments in an acceptable position and also relieve pain. That's why we need to immobilize or maintain reduction. So this can be open or non-operative modalities like casting, like I've said, traction and internal and external fixation modalities based on the fracture type. So uh, this is, uh, this is to show you like what uh, immobilization uh, does and what uh, a non-immobilized uh, uh, fracture um, a non, a non adequately immobilized uh, fracture uh, would go through. So this is why I'm saying we don't always need to rigidly immobilize. Like you can see for the first one, then the nail is uh, pretty, uh, it's, a, it's actually a contour, a contour nail. We never, we don't use that anymore. It's a World War II inven invention and it's out of practice now, but it's so tightly fitted. There is no micro motion at the fracture site. So there wasn't adequate callus uh, forming, but in a slightly loose, uh, a slightly loose uh, nail that's not tightly fitting into the medullary canal, there is callus formation. So we might want that. That's uh, that's why immobilization is not always is not always needed for all the fractures. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So uh, cast splintage is something we use uh, left and right. And anyone in uh, clinical practice 
that especially works in the emergency setup might have used it or you will use it in the future. So it's a, a chemically it's plaster of Paris or it's a hemihydrated calcium sulfate. It's widely used for either temporary splinting or for as a permanent uh, uh, management modality. But more than uh, more than anything in, in orthopedics, uh, we use plaster of Paris, and not just in orthopedics, not just for the orthopedic surgeon, general practitioners, nurses, health officers, anyone who's giving clinical care knows that they will at some point uh, face a trauma patient and they will have to use properly use uh, cast splintage. Of course, we see a lot of uh, Ill, uh, Ill applied or uh, harmfully even applied uh, plaster of Paris in our patients. And that, uh, that's a skill base that we need to build in, in our uh, clinical healthcare force. Uh, but I, I, I don't know how I'd be able to do that uh, in, in, in this presentation. However, please note that you should familiarize yourself in how to use a, a, a plaster of Paris, how to properly protect your patient, how to make sure that uh, splints are not tight when they need not be, and you're not applying circular cast when you shouldn't be applying circular cast. Just make sure that you do, you do, less, uh, you do less harm uh, when, when using that, don't do, do no harm first, right? So uh, make sure you're not burning your patients using the plaster of Paris because it's an exothermic reaction when it's put in water and it can actually cause some serious burn, especially in children. Even in adults, we see a lot of bl burn, blisters. We see a POP inflicted uh, compartment syndrome because of a tightly applied splint. So, uh, it's a skill. It's a it's a skill um, base that everybody should have. And sometimes they're just ill applied, like uh, they're not layered well, or they're not thick enough. They're too thin, or they're not um, well integrated. Like the layers are not integrated because they're not uh, uh, applied well or uh, prepared well. So yeah, like I've said, there are multiple complications to casts, like burns, thrombophilobitis, redisplacement, allergic reaction, compartment syndrome, and pressure source are some of the complications from cast application that uh, we see. Another way of immobilization or even uh, uh, definitive treatment is uh, continuous uh, traction. It can be skin applied or uh, skeletal. Uh, skin, we usually use it in pediatric age groups, but sometimes we use it in adults, especially um, in frail old uh, patients that we think are not going to take the skeletal traction well, or maybe a skin uh, traction temporarily suffices for these patients because of their uh, low weight. Sometimes we, we do use uh, skin traction in adults, but generally it's, it's meant for, for children. And even with, with the, those kinds of tractions, especially in skeletal tractions, we see some complications like the pin is applied at the wrong place and there's nerve injury and pin site infection is really high, especially in our country. It's in our setup, for example, at Rambestat, as high as 80% of our patients have a pin site infection, some degree of pin site infection, usually like grade one or two, but still it's very high. So these are just some images for you to familiarize yourself with what traction uh, looks like, either skin traction or skeletal traction. So another uh, very popular modality of uh, fracture fixation that we use that have become very popular now are internal fixation. They used to be uh, not used left and right. Um, non-operative management used to be quite popular, but the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a rise in uh, uh, utilization of internal fixation in our country. That's for multiple reasons. One is because of the personality of fracture we're seeing, one. Second, because of just availability of uh, implants and the technology. And the third and most important, I think, is because now we have the trained uh, personnel that are able to provide uh, the st that standard of care that uh, the world has accepted as the best possible care for uh, fractures. Uh, 
So because of these reasons, now we see a lot of internal application. Uh, I wish I had uh, that paper, but there is a new paper that came out from our department showing the trend of uh, practice in our uh, hospital. And we, we have seen like, I think if I remember correctly, don't quote me on it, but more than 70% uh, rise in um, the trend of uh, internal fixation. So some of the tools we use are like screws, plates and screws. I think I have some images here. It's better to just look at the images, yeah. So uh, interlocking uh, nails, uh, we've moved away from like uh, nails without, uh, that don't interlock, uh, like puncture nails. Now we have like second, third and fourth generation nails. Like, uh, so locking nails are what we use most popularly. We use screws and plates and multiple ranges of implant designs are now coming out. So it's a, it's a growing uh, field and the technology is ever changing and improving. Now, like we even have um, biodegradable implants and uh, customized 3D implants. So in uh, some centers in uh, the Western world, that's the implants they use because although our anatomies are uh, similar uh, at certain sites, we all have our uh, own distinct uh, personalities. Like our, our bodies are very similar, but they're, they're by no means identical. So different sites are different. So uh, in order to uh, attend to, tend to that, tend to that uh, they tend to lean towards precision medicine now. So they'll do like a 3D printing that's specific to your, to your tibia or your femur. The implant is made specifically for you. So that kind of thing is also possible. So another, another popular implant we use, this one you, we use a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, is external fixation and the indications. The most common indication is, of course, open fractures. We also use them for severe multiple injuries where we want to do like damage control orthopedics and in pelvic fractures. We also use it for um, either uh, for like limb lengthening, and in some, in some parts of the world, they use it for cosmetic limb lengthening. And we see some complications with the external fixations like um, damage to the soft tissue, pin tract infections are very common for us. Neurovascular damage, if they're not, if not, not, not applied well and physial injuries are also possible. So th this is what uh, external fixations would look like. There's a wide range of uh, external fixators it can be uniplanar, multiplanar, orthofixes. Um, the image you see, like uh, the the image you see, the fifth image you see is uh, what we call the Elizarov. We also have the TSF. These are used for like growth modulation, limb lengthening, deformity correction, uh, not just for open fractures. So it's a it's a versatile implant, and it's very popular. We use it. Uh, a lot in for multiple indications. So out of our three, uh, three pillars, reduction, maintaining reduction and rehabilitation, the one that every patient, every single patient who has suffered any kind of fracture should go through is the rehabilitation. We may not need to reduce a fracture. If it's not displaced, there is no indication to re reduce a fracture. Some fractures don't require immobilization, but every fracture requires rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is the non-negotiable one out of these three. So we want to preserve joint movement. We want to restore muscle power, and we want to put our patients back to, uh, back to function. So without rehabilitation, any kind of orthopedic procedure, any fancy procedure, any fancy implant is of no use. We want to uh, focus on rehabilitation, although we have poor rehabilitation setups. But all of, uh, every it's good if anyone, if any, if you if you work in an orthopedic setup or you have patients who've gone through an orthopedic surgery, you should be uh, able to at least initiate rehabilitation for them within a few hours of surgery. 
at least after 24 hours, some level of rehabilitation should be initiated. Of course, with communication with the surgeon, of course, but rehabilitation is the single most determining factor in terms of returning a patient back to everyday life. So <coughs> having discussed the principles, <coughs> Uh, open, fracture re open fractures require specific attention. So uh, we see, we're seeing a trend of rise in, ortho in, in uh, open fractures because of high energy uh, uh, traumas that we're seeing now. Uh, and open fractures should not be missed, like the diagnosis should not be missed by any health professional that comes across that. And they shouldn't think that, oh, it's an orthopedic case. It's not going to kill the patient. So there's no rush there. There is a rush there. Uh, every minute counts. You need to initiate antibiotics within 30 minutes or the chances of infection rises. And an infected open fracture is one of the, it's a, it's a disability in and of its own because we do debridement afterwards, but once an infection sets in, especially if it sets into the bone and the patient develops a chronic osteomyelitis, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a lifelong disability. They will have to deal with it for a major part of their lives and it's really difficult uh, to eradicate a, an infection that has seeded into a bone. So following after following the ATLS protocol, like all the other kinds of fractures, uh, we want to be able to uh, diagnose that it's an open fracture and initiate antibiotics as soon as possible. Within the thirty within thirty minutes has significant prognostic value. Within three hours, can save uh, the patient from developing uh, an infection. So we want to start as soon as we get the patient. So usually, like in our ED, if a patient comes in with open fracture and an orthopedic resident sees them. They don't order an, uh, antibiotics in the patient's card. They administer it immediately. TAT and antibiotics, the first dose of antibiotics, they administer it themselves. We administer it ourselves because we're, there's no time to wait. It is actually an emergency drug in this case. Antibiotics is an emergency drug for us in this particular case. So you want to do that. No debridement should be done in the emergency room. Just cover it with a saline-soaked gauze don't touch it, don't try to bring anything unless there's like grossly sticking out material from that wound. Don't try to uh, debride it in any sense in the emergency room. They should be rushed to the OR as soon as possible. In the meantime, just cover it with a saline soaked sterile gauze and also be vigilant for compartment syndrome. Just because the fracture is open, that doesn't mean there's no risk of uh, compartment syndrome. There, it's still possible. So. Just like any other patient, it, uh, make sure that compartment syndrome is not there and watch them for subsequent development of uh, compartment syndrome. Of course, TAT is always there. Antibiotics, TAT should not be forgotten. Like I'm sure everybody knows. Anyone with a wound should uh, receive uh, TAT. So uh, this, these patients should be rushed to the operating room as soon as possible. It's one of our emergencies, we're not going, we try not to let an open fracture stay overnight. We try to take them to the OR as soon as possible. Within six hours has been shown, there are multiple studies actually, some of them are conflicting, but one thing they all agree is you want to rush your patient to the OR. How, uh, how much do you want to rush is the question. Do you want to make sure you get them within six hours? You get them to the OR within six hours? Or is it okay to stay up to 24 hours? That's the argument. It's not, it's not whether or not uh, immediate surgery is needed or not immediate, immediate surgery is needed. Of course, debridement is important. So we take them to OR, we irrigate and debride, remove any foreign bodies and then stabilize the fracture, usually using an external fixator. We attend to the soft tissue. We debride whichever, whatever soft tissue is dead and then see how much cover we still have. So do we need uh, flaps? Are we going to have to employ uh, different soft tissue uh, coverage methods? Do we need a bone graft? Uh, those are things we look at. And in really extensive uh, cases uh, where the limb does not seem to be, uh, does not seem like it can be salvaged, we may opt for amputation, but definitely not uh, 
not definitely not immediately. We try to give the patient uh, some grace, some time, like maybe one, two, three, four debridements, and then we convince. Uh, if we're all convinced that that limb is not going to survive, then we opt for amputation. So um, this is what I have for you in, in terms of um, the management of open fractures. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions and I hope there are a lot of questions about management of open fractures because it's something worth discussing. So the last part of uh, uh, my, my presentation is going to be about complications of fracture. Uh, I'll, I will not go in, into every detail, but during the early phases, we need to look for um, associated injuries like <clears throat> visceral injuries, neurovascular injuries, any hemarthrosis or bleeding into the joint. And infection is also common, especially in open fractures, could be early or late. And uh, compartment syndrome is the one, the one complication we fear the most, try to prevent the most, and we don't want to miss that diagnosis because it's going to be, it's going to cost the patient their limbs. So we want to over-diagnose over -diagnose compartment syndrome. It's better to suspect compartment syndrome, do a fasciotomy, and then be wrong than it is to miss compartment syndrome. So these are like specific fracture sites and then uh, the subsequent uh, nerve injuries we might expect. I'm not going to go into it. So late complications, we might see pressure source, especially in ill applied slabs or like uh, splints, uh, POPs. Delayed union, malunion, nonunion are complications we, uh, we see. Some are more common in uh, some types of fractures. Uh, there are specific types of fractures where we fear these the most, like avascular, avascular necrosis. We, we expect or fear it in like femoral neck fractures. In any, any site where blood flow to that site is, uh, it's a watershed area or it has precarious blood flow. Growth disturbance, we see this in pediatrics. My sites of significance, we see this, so it's like overgrowth of bone in the soft tissue. We see it in the hip area and elbow area. Ischemic contracture is a, a late sequelae of compartment syndrome. Joint stiffness, that's, that has to be the most common complication we see in, in orthopedics. And this is primarily because of poor rehabilitation uh, protocols that we have or rehabilitation service that we have. We see a lot of uh, joint stiffness even in patients who have done uh, uh, rigid fixations on like anatomic reduction and rigid fixation on, uh, they develop. The reason we do fixation in the first place is so that the patient can go back to uh, daily activity as soon as possible. But we still see a lot of uh, joint stiffness. I hope that improves in, in, in due time. We see sudex dystrophy is not very common. It's a complex regional syndrome. It's a, sympathetic uh, dystrophy, it's a sympathetic dysfunction. Um, the exact mechanism is not known, but the patient has disproportionate pain after suffering a fracture, distal to that fracture site, like in a distal radius fracture, and then distal to that, they will have like swelling, redness, pain, and kind of dysregulated kind of pain, like sen uh, sensitivity to touch, burning sensation, it's that kind of uh, autonomic dysfunction. And also osteoarthritis, especially if we've gone anywhere near to near the joint uh, cartilage, if the fracture is intraarticular or our surgery is intraarticular, we had to open up a joint. In those cases, we see uh, osteoarthritis. So these are just image descriptions of the, what ischemic contracture can do. This is a patient who suffered a, a supracondylar fracture, and uh, following that, they have developed a compartment syndrome, and and then ultimately Volkmann's ischemic contracture of the forearm. It's a some common site for Volkmann's ischemic uh, contracture. This is an example of a complex regional pain syndrome or sudex dystrophy. You can see, even though the image is not clear, you can see in B that there's some kind of swelling, shininess, redness, and the C, the X-ray shows that there's diffuse osteoporosis. And the image in E shows that there's um, hyperactivity or increased uh, radionuclide uh, uptake. That means increased metabolic activity. So this is what 
complex regional pain syndrome would look like. It's not very common. Uh, usually it's managed by uh, pain specialists like anesthesiologists. Myocytes ossificans, like I've said, it's overgrowth of bone in the soft tissue. It's common in the hip and elbow area. Uh, there are there are grades to it, but for you, it's important to just uh, to be able to see an X-ray and diagnose why that stiffness is happening. It's because of overgrowth. So this is what the X-ray would look like. Uh, these are some images showing like uh, malunion and nonunion or pseudoarthrosis or like new joint formation, which is an end stage of uh, nonunion. Avascular necrosis has specific sites are common for that, like femur neck, scaphoid fracture, the talus. These are common sites where we expect. Uh, we might expect avascular necrosis this is because of the precarious blood flow to that uh, site. So um, this is all I had uh, for you. If you have any questions, um, uh, you're welcome to it. Should I go into the chat box for the questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can proceed to the, not the chat box, the Q&A. Okay, the Q&A, right. Yeah. Okay, so right off, uh, PET scan. So uh, we don't have PET scan uh, available left and right, and PET scans are indicated for uh, for cases where we suspect uh, metastasis, like diffuse metastasis, uh, not in cases of uh, a fracture or uh, it's more it's a, it's a diagnostic tool for malignancy. We don't, we, we don't use it for uh, fractures. There's really no benefits of, of doing a PET scan for a fracture. We may sometimes use bone scan. Uh, bone scan equ is equivalent to uh, MRI in like picking up uh, uh, fractures that are hard to, hard to diagnose. Like if we're suspecting a, a stress femur neck, sorry, <clears throat> a stress femur neck fracture, and we might do an, a bone scan or an MRI, but never, never a PET scan. Okay, so why, when do we use serine uh, classification of open fracture? There isn't, a, like, uh, there isn't specific cases that we use it for. It's one way of, it's very similar to Gustavo Anderson, actually. Uh, it's just, it, it's more uh, specific to the soft tissue. So uh, it has two, two types, classification of open fracture, like it's, uh, there's also a Shireen classification for soft tissue injuries. So we use it in research most of the time. I've seen it in research papers. We've never actually used it to communicate in, uh, in clinical setups. So, okay. The third question is, doctor, during my internship time, we frequently was asked about Gustavo Anderson classification at mornings, but that's wrong, as I hear it's an intraoperative classification, right? Uh, yeah, true. Uh, so, like you, uh, th that's a very common uh, m misconception. So, when when you're asked about it, uh, it's not to for it shouldn't be to for you to label that that patient with a Gustavo Anderson uh, classification because we don't classify our patients until the first. The first, <clears throat> the first debridement. So it's a yeah, it's an intraoperative uh, classification. But maybe you're asked about it a lot to make sure that you know you are aware of it. You're aware of uh, the classification system. You're aware of the parameters. You're aware of which is what. Not not for you to to label a patient like it's it's it it doesn't make sense to, to do that. So you're right. Yeah, it doesn't it's it's not it's not right to ask you to label the patient. But if you've noticed, no, no, no patient, no uh, resident, or at least no good resident is going to write down a Gustavo Anderson classification definitively on a patient's card after evaluating them in the emergency room. Like uh, if it's like a three, if there's a vascular injury and you've already diagnosed a vascular injury, then you can you can definitely say three uh, three C, because now you know if there is any vascular injury, that's a three C. If it's a heavily contaminated uh, uh, 
open fracture, it's at least a 3A. So you can say that, you can say at least a 3A, it's a, definitely a 3C because it's the maximum you can go, right? But you can never say a two or a one until you do your first debridement. So uh, the, th the fourth one is, what do you think mortality high, why do you, what do you think mortality higher in our country as well road traffic accident commerce? Oh, there's, there's a, a plethora of factors for that. Uh, anything from uh, poor car services, bad roads, uh, poorly trained drivers. Uh, uh, yeah, and then mortality is high because of the poor uh, pre-hospital service, even poor emergency service. All of this factor in, into the mortality rate following road traffic uh, injury. We have high, high numbers of uh, accidents compared to the rest of the world. Uh, and compared to the number of cars we have per capita. It's a plethora of factors. The fifth one is during the war, we had mangled limb hanging just by skin. We had to refer them, but what would have been done before the referral? Uh, this is a tough one, a mangled extremity. In a, in the, in a perfect world, they shouldn't be referred. They should be, uh, managed uh, there, but it's a very di difficult decision to decide to amputate a patient following trauma. Uh, sometimes uh, we know right off the bat, like we do the, the mesh score, like, of course, it's not, uh, it shouldn't guide whether or not you uh, amputate a patient, but there is the mangled extremity severity score or the mesh score that we use. And we, we, we know that 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 limb is not going to survive, but sometimes we we end up applying uh, an external fixator because the patient will never consent. It's one of the most depressing things. Like uh, it's very it's easy to amputate a diabetic patient once they develop gangrene because they know they've been losing their limb chronically for a while. It's already darkened. They've seen it darken. It causes pain. They want it cut off. To be honest, but to convince a trauma patient. Uh, to go through amputation, even from a tip of a finger, uh, it's really difficult. And we want to give them enough uh, time for them to mentally adjust to, to that fact. We don't want to give them a shock because it, it's, it's been known to cause severe PTS, PTSD and also severe depression, which is going to affect their quality of life anyway. So we try to ease them into it. And sometimes we do actually immobilize limbs that we know are not going to survive and uh, wait for the patient to see it to darken and uh, start to die so they can be convinced for an amputation. But it's, it's really difficult. I don't, I, I don't know what uh, a general practitioner or any health professional can do from a referral site uh, other than refer them as soon as possible and then let the, let the surgeon deal with them. Okay, uh, are you still using POP tractions and how are the outcomes with this use? Uh, I wish someone would study that, would study it. It's a really good uh, research question to do a comparative study. Yes, we don't still use uh, POP traction. So it's birthed, birthed from a problem because we are having like exceptionally high uh, pin site infections with our uh, skeletal traction. So we started to employ uh, POP for traction, and we've had uh, like we've had okay uh, results like for temporary mobilization until we do like a definitive fixation, we use it for traction. And I wish, you know what? It's a really good uh, research question. And I think we should do that. We should. It's about time that we do a comparative study of POP traction versus uh, skeletal traction in terms of achieving adequate. Uh, Immobilization, adequate reduction, and also uh, prevention of uh, infection. Thank you for that. Yeah, we still use them. Do we remove internal fixations? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the patient's age, on the sites where the implant is applied, and also if we have any complication. So, for instance, we don't usually recommend removing intramedullary um, devices unless there is uh, an infection or the child is a growing child and we don't want to impinge on the 
growth of the patient. Other than that, we don't, we may not remove it. Even plates, if, if it's a buried site, there is bulky soft tissue covering it. In adults, we, we don't, it's actually a really major surgery. Sometimes it's harder to remove implants than it is to put them in. And it also takes longer, it puts the patient at risk, like uh, it's a, a major surgery in and of itself. So we don't uh, remove implants unless there is a clear indication. Uh, okay, the next question is, what is the recommendation for fast referring every fracture to orthopedic surgeon, even missing growth, uh, other injury? I think uh, uh, my understanding is, should we refer every patient? Should we refer every fracture? Uh, if we have enough orthopedic surgeons, uh, it, don't quote me on this, but my personal opinion is, if you can get them to an orthopedic surgeon, refer every every fracture. If you have diagnosed a fracture, I think you should refer every every fracture. Let the orthopedic surgeon decide uh, whether or not he he wants to intervene in any way or uh, let it be. But if we have enough uh, surgeons, why not? They should at least take one look at it. What antibiotics do we use for uh, open uh, fractures? Okay, so the international recommendation for type uh, Gustavo Anderson type one and type two is to use uh, first generation cephalosporins, and for uh, for three and also like depending on the extent of contamination or type of contamination, we may add other kinds of antibiotics. Most commonly, aminoglycosides. We may also add like other types of antibiotics based on the contamination, like if it's a free, if we fear um, Clostridium contamination, we'll add like penicillin. Uh, so it depends on uh, the site the fracture was suffered uh, at. So it's like a, if we expect um, gram negative uh, contamination or anaerobic contamination, we wanna tend to that. So in three, usually we add aminoglycosides in addition to first generation cephalosporin. In our setup, we use uh, ceftriaxone. We use uh, third generation cephalosporin. We use ceftriaxone. But uh, the, the uh, international uh, recommendation is to use uh, first generation cephalosporin. That, that means like antibiotics that have good uh, gram positive coverage. Uh, ceftriaxone has both, but it has more or less uh, stronger gram negative coverage, right? Okay, so lack of instruments in most of government hospitals is bottleneck for some surgeons. Your comment? Yes, it is. It's very true. Most of our orthopedic practice, especially in government hospitals, is dependent on uh, donation. Implants are very expensive. Uh, it's expensive everywhere in the world. Uh, orthopedic surgery uh, costs. It's the most expensive kind of, kind of surgery. And even in the Western world, like most insurance doesn't cover it because it's so expensive. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I don't think we're, as a country, we're gonna afford implants. We're gonna be donation-based uh, for quite some time, but there are some implants coming in like from India and China, although they're not as high uh, of a quality. But yeah, I have no, no recommendation for that. So it's not an easy answer. Hello, thanks for a great presentation. My question is when patient has malunion that has stayed for months, what's the indication for doing surgery to correct it, especially in the upper limb? Yeah, so functionality is uh, the most important thing. Once a patient, once a fracture has healed, it's so malunited, uh, we're gonna look at how functional the limb is, how functional the patient is, and then uh, based on that, decide if we're going to do a correction osteotomy and internal fixation or not. So essentially, if need arises, we're going we're gonna to break the bone again, maybe at the, at the old fracture site or even a different site, and then reposition it at a functional position and fix it there. So that's what we would do if surgery is indicated. What's the most preferred antibiotics for open fracture? Yeah, so I've answered that. Choice of antibiotics for two and three, also answered that. Uh, okay, for open fractures following gunshots uh, injury. 
Yeah, so with gunshot injury, uh, clostridium uh, contamination is a, is a possibility. So add penicillin. But the thing with the gunshot uh, wounds is they're either very clean and they heal very fast or uh, they're a catastrophe with uh, polymicrobial uh, seeding and uh, usually clostridium. And then they de the patient develops like uh, gas gangrene very fast. So it's one or the other, and uh, don't uh, don't ask me why. I don't think anyone knows why, but it's usually one or the other. We see that a lot. Uh, the thing is, like uh, gunshot wounds, we say gunshot wounds. It's an umbrella term. There are different kinds of guns and multiple kinds of bullets, and the, their trajectory is different. The kind of soft tissue injury they inflict is different, and uh, so based on that, like we see different patterns. Uh, for now, now we have bullets like uh, that. Um, some bullets cause maximum impact at, uh, at contact. The others, uh, the the entry wound is really tiny. You'll see that, and then they uh, the what do you call it? Like as it goes through into the soft tissue, it kind of propels. And then there's like extensive soft tissue injury when you open it up because it has like a propagative effect. And then the exit wind is really large. And then now they have new bullets that uh, vibrate. Some of them rotate inside. Some of them actually have um, shells. They open up within the body once they enter. So these are all meant to cause maximum damage. So they're, they're designed to kill. So there are different uh, bullet injuries now, and the kinds of uh, pattern of injury we see is also different based on the bullet, the range, is it high velocity, low velocity, is it close range, uh, is it from afar, uh, what kind of bullet is it, uh, all of these things all, uh, factor in. But I, we add penicillin. That's what I guess we do, because we're trying to prevent uh, clostridium. We're trying to prevent uh, gas gangrene. Uh, comment on the long waiting time for orthopedic surgery in our setup. I, this, uh, <laughs> I think this is like way out of uh, our scope of discussion. It's, it's, a, it's like a hospital admin uh, issue. But I, I will say that if there is a long waiting time uh, for non-trauma uh, non orthopedic cases, it's because of the high burden of trauma we have. So trauma predominates our practice, it takes over um, most of our debts, most of our um, uh, uh, workforce. So we, uh, our uh, cold cases or our non-trauma orthopedic cases tend to take a backbench. That's what happens in most setups. When do we see CT scan uh, other than calcaneal acetabular fracture? So yeah. We can use, we order CT scan for periarticular fractures as well, mostly. Now we order it a lot because we want to be very precise about all the fragments within the joint. But in non articular uh, fractures, we may not need it. Uh, so it's, it's basically to increase our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our preparation. So we, we want to be very aware of what we're going to find intraoperatively. Before we go in, we don't want to miss anything, and the CT scan affords us that. So when the when it's available, when the patient can afford it, we're using it more and more. Although sometimes not justly, but uh, when we need it, we do use it, especially for, uh, like you said, for cervical fract cervical fractures, for um, spine fractures, for calcaneal fractures, for pelvic fractures, for periarticular fractures. These are the most common reasons uh, we order CT scan for. Please recommend on the best time of fracture traction, uh, fracture traction of wound after uh, accident. Uh, and I, it's not clear. If you mean when to apply traction, depends on why you're applying traction. But if you're trying to apply traction either to achieve reduction or uh, to maintain your reduction, then you need to apply it as soon as you can, but don't apply traction to an open wound. We, we don't do that. If it's an open fracture, 
we, do, we don't apply traction. We want to take the patient to the OR, stabilize with a slab, uh, at, uh, cover up the wound, stabilize with a slab with a splint, then take them to the OR. And then uh, the, uh, the implant of trace or the immobilization of trace is going to be external fixation. What's the indication of the open reduction of uh, clavicular fracture? So there are multiple indications for uh, open reduction of cal uh, clavicular fracture. Uh, one is that, like if it's an open fracture, if there's more than 100% displacement, if there's uh, more than uh, like two centimeters of overlap, could be another, if, it, if it's tenting on the skin and it looks like it's an impending open uh, fracture, in these cases, might, we might opt to uh, uh, operate, but it's not, uh, uh, we, there are, it's controversial. Uh, there are some studies showing that even with 100% displacement, even with the bilateral clavicular fracture, unless it's open, uh, the patient might do well with uh, non-operative management. So uh, it's, a, it's a controversial area. Uh, How common so do you, in so I'll address the one about uh, necrosizing fascia. How common do you encounter necrosizing fascia in trauma and fracture sustaining patients? How can you avoid it uh, ad in addition to administering proper antibiotics? Uh, it's an insidious, uh, uh, and it's, not, it's a uh, fastly progressing uh, anaerobic infection, necrosizing fascia. And sometimes we see it following uh, open fracture. I don't have the stats on that. Uh, but we can avoid it by starting uh, prophylactic antibiotics as early as possible, within 30 minutes, preferably, if not, at least within, uh, uh, within three hours. And then cover for the, anti the, the, the uh, poly for, and then do like a polymicrobial coverage. Even if it's bilateral clavicular fracture, uh, yeah, even if it's bilateral clavicular fracture, yeah, even in bilateral cases, non-operative might be better unless the patient wants to go back to, like in athletes, for instance, they insist on uh, fixation, so they get fixed, but it's not, uh, it's not a requirement. I guess if we're out of time, then... Uh, um, I don't know. Email me if it's a really important question and you think it's, uh, I need to answer it. I guess you can email me. That's that's it. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this amazing session that uh, we have we had. Um, I I know we took a, a long time for the Q and Q and A, but I think that's a plus because it addresses mm -hmm. the questions our participants. So uh, I, we really we really like to thank you on behalf of both both Blue Health and our, our participants. And, it was yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. It was a pleasure being with you. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you so much.